Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Friday Ground School series for cross country. Our topic this evening is collision avoidance technologies. And uh, so let's get started down the merry little path. So here's the list of all our seminars, and the arrow is pointing it tonight. So collision avoidance technologies, transponders, flarms, the types of units, the usage, what they can, and probably more importantly, what they can't do. Um, <clears throat> in order to download, uh, the SSA is giving us space for the recording and for the slides. So here's the instructions on how to go get them, go get it. Notice that that's members.ssa.org. Um, and you log in with your member ID. Uh, we need to thank the SSA for the web so uh, webinar software and to Frank Whiteley in particular because he sits in the background to make sure that all of this stuff works. Uh, we have members of our club that are part of the WINGS, uh, the FAST team, the FAA safety team. And these are the folks that do all the paperwork to make sure that these seminar sessions are eligible for WINGS credit and get them on the schedule and that kind of thing. So uh, the only thing that you'll run into is it's only the live session that is eligible for WINGS credit. So if you have somebody that wants to see it and they download it, uh, you know, viewing the presentation or listening to the recording is not uh, eligible for WINGS credit. We have some of our instructors hiding in the background. If you have questions, type your questions in. They will uh, attempt to answer them and uh, they'll collect and we will have a time for Q&A at the end of the presentation uh, where we can do for ones that they haven't answered back or they've said they wanna wait and have me answer for the uh, across the entire group. We'll do that at the end of the presentation. An interesting thing, uh, before we get started with tonight's topic, there is a fun little thing that's happened with the uh, FAA. They have, uh, and this is since we had the cockpit computer presentation in February, the FAA has released a new uh, advisory circular uh, AC 9178A, and it was released on the 23rd of February this year, and it addresses the use of electronic flight bags. Now, you need to remember, this is an advisory circular, so this is an interpretation of the regulations. The regulations dictate what kind of in-flight information must be available to the pilot. This advisory circular do documents an official interpretation of an acceptable approach for providing that required flight information to the pilot. So I'm just going to read the quote. This is a paragraph I copied directly out of the advisory circular. The bullets and the emphasis on the items I added, but this is the wording from the document. EFB systems may be used in conjunction with or to replace the paper reference materials that pilots typically carry in the flight deck. EFBs can electronically store and retrieve information required for flight operations, such as the pilot operating handbook and its supplements, minimum equipment lists, weight and balance calculations, aeronautical charts, and terminal procedures. Okay. I've chased the bunny trail and decided that my cockpit computer satisfies the definition of an EFB. And if I can put all of this material on there and can access it, you know, reasonably well in the cockpit, then I'm good with uh, having all electronic copies. Now, here's my caveat. Don't take my word for it. Do your own research and de decide for yourself. Uh, the nice thing is they've got the reference section and uh, in the advisory circular so that you can uh, start there and chase the bunny trail about uh, how you what your system has to be able to do and, and what kind of system it is and stuff like that. But this came out, uh, I just became aware of this in the last week and I thought it was important enough uh, to put out there. All right, 
On to our uh, topic for the evening, which is collision avoidance technologies. Tonight's session will be between an hour and a half and two hours long. So just so you have some expectations there. So the purpose of our course tonight is we're going to describe the collision avoidance technologies and we're going to describe example systems. And I think probably especially for the air traffic control system, you know, we, we need to understand where we are, how we got to where we are and what it really does for us. I've heard my entire flying career that the FAA regulations are often written in blood. So this little slide, when we get through with it, you I think you'll probably agree. In 1952, radar was first used in the terminal areas. These were generally military surplus search and warning radars. They weren't optimized for air traffic control purposes. They didn't know what air traffic control was, you know, radar was going to be at that time. This was a primary surveillance radar. In other words, it was reflecting off of the aircraft. The aircraft didn't have a transponder, didn't need one or anything like that. In 1956, there was a midair over the Grand Canyon. It was the United DC-7 and a TWA Super Connie. The uh, United DC-7 hit the Transworld Airlines Super Constellation over the Grand Canyon National Park. There were a total of 128 folks on in both aircraft. Everyone died, everyone perished. This was the first commercial airline crash in uh, to result in more than 100 deaths. The collision took place, you know, remember our, air, our airspace system was very different back then. This collision took space, place in uncontrolled airspace. So this was the uh, the old uh, pilot's responsibility is to maintain the separation, you know, the old see and avoid system. Two years later, over Las Vegas, there was a collision between a United DC-7 and an Air Force F-100F. Early morning, like 8.30, clear skies, excellent visibility, you know, like 35 miles. The flight paths of the two aircraft intersected about nine miles southwest of Las Vegas. The converging aircraft collided in nearly a head-on uh, configuration. They were at about 21,000 feet. Closure rate was estimated at 665 knots. Uh, here's one of the fun things. Two separate agencies were controlling the aircraft. The military was controlling the military aircraft and the civilian agency was controlling the civilian aircraft. They were not communicating directly with each other. It is also believed that uh, some of the structures in the windscreen, so the frames and stuff like that, may have blocked the view of the other aircraft from both aircraft. You know how you can get something behind the A-pillar in your car? Well, they got something behind the equivalent in their cockpits. Uh, in 58, one of the things that uh, they did is they transferred all NAS, the National Airspace System Air Traffic Control to the FAA. They also did an upgrade to the ATC systems and the radars of that time. In 1960, the concept of a secondary surveillance radar. This is the one that uses uh, the transponder in the aircraft, it uses a beacon to respond to the radar to enhance the ability of the radar to see the aircraft. In 67, in Dayton, Ohio, we had a TWA DC-9 and a VFR Beach Baron went bump. Now, so sometime in 1961, uh, the FARs had mandated a speed restriction below 10,000 feet within 30 miles of a destination airport. Okay, and that was the result of another mid-air collision. Well, as a result of the collision over Dayton in 1970, aircraft in all areas below 10,000 feet were prohibited from exceeding 250 knots because they considered that airspeed was a contributing factor to the collision over Dayton. And the Dayton accident was one of the contributing factors to the FAA's decision to create terminal control areas, what we now call Class B airspace, around the busiest airports in the country. Now, interesting little aside, 
the airspace around Dayton never received a TCA, and it got some minor changes until it was reclassified as Class C airspace in the late 1980s. It's one of those things I find kind of interesting. In 1986, um, I was flying at that time, and I remember this, this accident. An Aeromexico DC-9 and a Piper Cherokee went bump over Cerritos, California. As a result of this accident and another near mid-air collision in terminal control areas, the FAA required that all jets in U.S. airspace be equipped with uh, traffic collision avoidance systems. Uh, you've heard the acronym TCAS. And it further required that all light aircraft operating in dense airspace be equipped with mode C transponders. So we picked up the requirement for our transponders to uh, report our altitude. And, you know, in 2020, we're all aware that ADSB out was now required in certain airspace. Now, one thing at this point, we all need please to understand that the current air traffic control based collision avoidance approach is about avoiding collisions involving large passenger carrying aircraft. Further, the focus is on aircraft that are operating under instrument flight rules, regardless of the actual weather condition. There is no ATC system out there that's trying to keep everybody separated. So when we look at collision avoidance, you know, basically we want to prevent things from going bump. Uh, increasingly, the big sky model is inadequate for aircraft separation. Uh, you know, we've seen it with airplane to glider and glider to glider. The see and avoid hasn't been a sufficient methodology going all the way back, uh, you know, to that accident between the F-100 and the DC-7. We get gliders concentrated in a small area. We're thermaling, we've got blind spots, we have high speed head on closing flights in some parts of the country. So what it boils down to is that we need some kind of assistance. With that, you know, we're gonna talk about the air traffic control based collision avoidance. Again, this is, uh, it's based, its implementation is based on potential collision conditions being detected in the ground-based systems, and then warnings being issued to the involved aircraft by the ground-based controllers. So if the ATC controller doesn't see a problem and the system doesn't highlight it to him, he's not issuing a warning. The other one with air traffic control is if you're not talking to air traffic control, there's no warning to you. So one of the things that we need to re realize when we're talking about this is the transponder requirements are primarily for high density traffic areas and also for IFR traffic separation. Gliders are exempt from the transponder requirements and ADSB out requirements. Okay, now this glider exemption is based on aircraft category. So it's glider category a glider having an engine driven electrical system is a non sequitur when it comes to transponder and ADSB out requirements. Okay, because the exemption is based on the aircraft category. We have voluntarily installed transponders to improve our visibility to the other national airspace users. Um, so now the transponder and ADSB installation helps. Uh, it helps ATC to see the gliders. It helps with the heavies because their TCAS gets an indication. There's another system called Airborne Collision Avoidance System, and they get warning indications. And uh, since this is a line of sight, this doesn't have an intervention by an air traffic controller. This is indications provided directly to the pilot of the aircraft that's got the uh, TCAS system in it. We have a nationwide transponder code, uh, 1202. It's only for gliders. Uh, it's similar to the concept of the VFR 1200 transponder code, but supposedly there is special processing within the ATC systems so that we don't drop off the display because we have low ground speeds. There was a time, you know, for instance, like 1200, you went below 60 knots and you dropped off the radar because the system said, oh, you're not flying anymore. Well, we can drop off with 
low ground speed because we're thermaling. We can drop off with low ground speed because we're parked in wave, okay? So one of the things that was supposed to happen, and I don't really know if it did, but supposedly with 1202, they took out that low speed restriction. The other one, you know, we're not required to be talking to ATC when we're squawking 1202. So there's no collision warning from ATC if you're not talking to ATC. I mean, it seems obvious, but anyway. The, uh, you know, a lot of our collision is non-ATC based. Uh, historically, their collision avoidance isn't adequate for glider operations. First off, our operations do not fit the ATC's model of aircraft operations. We are not point A to point B transportation in the way the rest of the world thinks of that. There are equipment limitations with the transponder systems. Uh, for instance, formation flights, closely spaced aircraft. ATC will give you guidance that only one aircraft in the formation turn their transponder on because the system, once we get close enough to each other, even though we are not unsafe, the system can't separate the returns. They're getting too many returns coming back from the transponders. So for instance, in our situation, if we've got a glider on tow and we're only 200 feet behind the tow plane and he's got a transponder turned on, ATC with the uh, mode C and up through mode S transponders would ask us to only have one transponder turned on because otherwise it just turns into a blob and they don't know what to do with it. And of course, they're not trained in what we do with gliders. Uh, and sometimes I don't think we necessarily want them widespread knowledge of what we're doing with gliders. And I mean, can you imagine an ATC specialist sitting on the ground trying to sort out a thermal with 20 or 30 gliders in it? I mean, it, it, that thing just has to look like a blob on their, in their system. Either that or it just throws up a warning and says, stay away from this blob. And of course, this requires participation of ground-based assets. So one of the things that's been developed over the last, oh, what, 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years, is a peer-to-peer -peer system. So the gliders interact directly with each other without a pilot intervention. The system resolution is adequate for close quarters operation. We get predictions of aircraft movement and alerts are presented directly to the pilot in the aircraft in real time. Okay, so basically what I'm describing is the farm system and we'll talk more about that later. When we talk about the air traffic control system, so, we got a radar system out there and it's got a rotating antenna and it's got transponders in the aircraft. The ground antenna sweeps a beam out. It's very narrow and it's vertical. So it sees, you know, it, it can come back with angles and distance real easily. The transponder response is sending back data from the transponder. So, you know, the ATC code that they're squawking and altitude and with more advanced transponders, more data. So the key here is we're, they're collecting, the ATC system is collecting information and it's being displayed. It's not just primary radar returns and they can put data blocks on their screen about who it is, what kind of aircraft, that kind of thing. So that works out real nice. The overall structure of the system, okay? This is a typical airport surveillance radar antenna. This is for a system that goes out about 60 miles from the airport. The big mesh antenna is the radar antenna with the feed into it. This system operates, or this particular system operates at 2,700 megahertz. And it determines the range and the bearing to the aircraft. This is a primary surveillance radar. So the aircraft doesn't have to have a transponder for this antenna and the system it's connected to to work. The secondary surveillance radar is this antenna on top. This is the antenna that uh, is talking to your transponder. So it sends out a signal at 1030 megahertz and our transponders respond to it at 1090 megahertz. So these two systems are running at completely different frequencies and they are providing completely different services, but being co-located like this, 
they're pointed at the same direction at the same time. Okay. This uh, this gives us a real nice, you know, this gives them a complete three-dimensional picture because they have the distance from the radar transmitter and they have the angle and with the altitude reported back from a mode C transponder, they have the altitude. So they have a complete three-dimensional solution with the mode A code. They have a unique identifier for the aircraft. So in this case, they have a unique solution with an identifier associated with that radar return. When we look on the aircraft side, we've got two types of airborne devices. We have an active device. That active device transmits something. So we have an interrogated, and by that I mean a transponder. We have a system that can be interrogated and broadcast, and then we can have a system that is broadcast only. And then the other type is passive, which is a receive only system. So let's take a look at uh, active systems. So interrogated device, the source, that radar antenna or that radar, those two systems that are sitting on that uh, radio, on that radar tower. The interrogator for the uh, uh, secondary surveillance radar transmits on 1030 megahertz and it detects and measures between the primary and the secondary surveillance radar. They detect and measure the aircraft position, in other words, the bearing and distance. The uh, 1030 signal requests additional aircraft information, so identity and altitude. And in order to provide the full suite of information, it requires transponder equipped aircraft. On the airboard side, the interrogation source can be a TCAS system or an ACAS system. These guys transmit and uh, directly. So they are operating completely self-contained. It doesn't require intervention from the ground, whereas the other one I'm describing is ground-based. The interrogated device in the aircraft. So our transponders, they transmit on 1090 megahertz. Mode A, which was the early version, is only transmitting a ATC assigned code. There are 4096 uh, ID codes and several of them are reserved and we all knew them at one, one point, right? And then they added the most C capability for civil aircraft and this added the pressure altitude and the pressure altitude is always in reference to 2992 uh, barometric pressure. This transmits the ATC assigned code that mode A transmits and it transmits the uh, aircraft altitude. A few years back, they added mode S and what this added to it is a selective unique interrogation. In other words, it added an address. So now with a mode S, it transmits ATC assigned code, the aircraft altitude and an aircraft specific registry code. The other capability that it provides is a that the transponder in a specific aircraft can be individually addressed. Now, the whole purpose behind this is like with TCAS or ACAS, they could not they could identify a target to their system and say, I just want updates on that one. And that's the one that responds. Well, OK, that one and every other mode C transmitter that's, you know, in the range or in the field of uh, view for that uh, transmission. OK, now we have both interrogated and broadcast devices. And now what we're coming into is the ADSB, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. Automatic means that the operation of this requires no pilot input or external interrogation. The pilot turns it on, and that's all he has to do. OK, it will send the data. He's not saying send the data. It will send the data. It's dependent which means it depends on an accurate position and velocity data from the aircraft's navigation system. And of course, we've all come to expect that to be the GPS system as the source for that data. Surveillance means it's providing the aircraft position, altitude, velocity, and other data to the facilities that require the information. 
and broadcast means that the information is continually broadcast for monitoring by an appropriately equipped ground station or the aircraft. Okay, this is the core technology behind what was called the FAA's Next Generation Air Traffic Control System. The data link transceiver automatically responds to the aircraft's location and other and transmits the data at regular intervals. It's two times per second. Unlike mode A, C, or S transponders, the ADSB system does not wait to be interrogated. You turn it on, it starts transmitting. So, ADSB out. It broadcasts twice a second on 1090 megahertz, and it also can respond to the secondary surveillance radar interrogation so it can respond to that uh, ground transmission. The broadcasts that are coming down from the aircraft are far more complex than what they were with just mode C or mode S. So we get a flight identification, that could be a flight number or a call sign. We also get this aircraft address. So this is a globally, and I mean worldwide, unique airframe code. Uh, it's a 24-bit code. We talk about it. Uh, it's divided up into uh, four-bit symbols, so we get six symbols. You'll hear it referred to as hexadecimal, but this is the six-digit code if you're playing with a mode S or an ADSB system. The first one, two, or three character or symbols specify the country. All USA codes begin with A. And USA codes are derived from the aircraft end number. So if you change the end number on your aircraft, your ICAO 24-bit code for your aircraft will change. So, you know, you go get your custom end number. Uh, you got to go back in and change the uh, ICAO code in your transponder. There's at least... 18 pieces of types of data that can be broadcast depending on the circumstances of the flight. For instance, that list that's on the screen right now has 15 different types of data in there. Um, the other thing that turns up is it's also not just data about the aircraft. One of the things that happens is there is information concerning the performance of the GPS receiver and the quality of the received GPS data. I'll talk about this more a little bit later, but this is why you can't just take your uh, garden variety GPS and plug it into your trig and say that you're an ADSB out compliant aircraft. The one thing that is not transmitted in this data there is nothing about the make and model of the airborne uh, equipment for ADSB out. They're not interested in the make and models or what you have installed. There's nothing like that in the transmitted stream. ADSB out has two large umbrella modes. They have a ground mode. And when it's on the surface and you're turned on, you know, for instance, if you turned your trig all the way to alt, and or out, however you want to say the abbreviation for altitude reporting. Uh, if you're on the ground sitting still, it transmits your surface position once every five seconds. If you're moving, it transmits twice per second. Notice that the airborne position is not sent when you're sitting on the ground. In airborne mode, the surface position is not sent, but the airborne position and airborne velocity is sent twice per second. Okay. Now, there is a, it's not really an issue, but there is something we need to talk about. Simply because most of the ADSB equipped gliders that I've seen are using a trig system, we need to discuss trigs, GPS based switching between ground and airborne. Uh, this mechanism has been proven to be problematic. For instance, after the 2021 Nephi contest, there were reports of the FAA contacting individual aircraft owners about the signals that their ADSB signal systems were producing. Okay, so either they were sitting on the ground sending airborne mode, or they were in the air sending ground mode. Now, the trig manual says 
Automatic air to ground switching is optional for a TABS application. TABS is a thing defined by the FAA for less than a full blown ADSB out system. But if you are going to uh, comply with FAR 91.227, you have to have correct air to ground switching. Well, the FAA doesn't know whether you've got a TABS installation or whether you've got a full blown 91 227 installation. So the surface position or the ground mode is used to facilitate ground handling, taxiing operations at airports, for instance, for those of you in the Denver area or any large area with, or area with large airport. They're not so much using that ground radar for taxiing ground control, they're using uh, the ADSB. Because remember, for those of you that have an ADSB system, you had to put in your wingspan and the length of your fuselage and where the uh, GPS antenna is placed, displaced on your aircraft from the center line of the aircraft and from the nose of the aircraft. Because they can use this to say, you know, you need to stop, you won't fit. Now, one of the things was. Trigg said that with a TABS installation, things like hot air balloons and unpowered gliders, there was no benefit in having air to ground switching and the squat switch, if you had a squat switch or the squat switch setting should be set to none. If the aircraft has a physical squat switch or it has an airspeed switch, then that should be used for air to ground determination. And if it doesn't, it says that the device can be used to emulate a squat switch by selecting auto on GPS data. And this is where the problem comes in because we have folks that are doing that. And as long as you stay within the parameters, it works just fine. But if you've got very low ground speed, you know, like some rotorcraft or airships or ultralights and perhaps gliders, uh, perhaps we need an airspeed switch to switch between, you know, who are live to switch between ground and air. Trig says if you have an installed airspeed switches or a squat switch, you really shouldn't for something that's flying other than like a, a hot air balloon or that kind of thing, that you really shouldn't be using the automatic switching using GPS alone. Uh, has GPS based switching worked for gliders? Sure. Has GPS switching seemed to indicate ground mode while the glider is in the air? Yeah. Park your glider in wave or be fighting a strong headwind. And, uh, you know, depending on what the airspeed setting is, you know, where it says I ought to be switching, um, it might incorrectly indicate the ground mode. Uh, Trig is trying to, Trig's algorithm, I don't know if it's still true, but at the time I did this research, Trig was using uh the change in airspeed and the change in climb rate so one of the things that can happen is if your airspeed drops and you don't really have a climb rate um it might flap back and forth between these especially if you were sitting in, in those modes especially if you were sitting in the conditions that would that cause that to happen when i did the first test on the system in my glider uh, the flight report indicated indica uh, incorrect flight mode. In other words, I had in-flight while on the ground. And I ended up having to correct the problem. I ended up putting in an uh, uh, airspeed switch uh, so that, you know, I eventually got to where I had a clean report so I could, you know, sign off the thing that I had a complete installation and it had been completely tested. The uh, USA has... Two airborne ADSB out compliance methods. The first one is a mode S transponder with what is called an extended squitter ES. So you'll see mode S slash ES. It operates on 1090 megahertz. The ES refers to the ADSB information that was that has now been appended to the mode S data. Okay. Now, requires, and I've got certified in parentheses, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, uh, but we want a WAS, a wide area augmentation system GPS source. 
and it has to have a quality of service indicator associated with it. Now, the wide area augmentation system provides processing that improves the uh, accuracy of the GPS systems. That goes back to when we had selective av availability. And it also adds data quality and signal integrity indicators to the data stream. Consumer grade GPS receivers. So your mobile phone, your farm, your Garmin backpacking GPS do not provide the required data quality and signal integrity indicators. Okay. So that's why you can't use those and plug them into your trig transponder and say, oh, I'm ADSB out compliant. The UAT, Universal Access Transceiver. Okay. They came up with this guy. Uh, one, because they wanted an upgrade path that didn't require everybody to change out their mode C transponders or their, yeah, their mode C transponders. Um, and the other one was they also came up with a, this gives a wider bandwidth for data. And so this also gives access to more information coming up from the ground that you can't get on the uh, transponder based system, the mode S extended squitter transponder based system. The UAT requires a mode C transponder. It cannot be used with the mode S transponder. There's a characteristic of mode S that uh, is incompatible with UAT and that goes all the way back to this technical standard order that defines UAT. So it's not something that's going to get corrected. It's you don't use it with mode S transponder. It requires a mode C transponder. It's an additional box in your aircraft. It transmits on 978 megahertz. And for instance, one of our tow planes at uh, uh, Black Forest is equipped with mode C transponder and a UAT trans, uh, trans, uh, transceiver. It's uh, installed between the transponder and the antenna. And the way it works is the transponder transmits in response to the ground radar interrogation. The UAT, since it's in between the transponder and the uh, antenna, transmits in response to the transponder's transmission, and it picks up the uh, ATC code and the mode C altitude from the transponder signal and then sends the ADSB out packet out on the 978 megahertz lane. And why the mode C altitude? I mean, you know, you got GPS altitude in this other box. Well, it's because the ADSB out signal includes both a barometric altitude and GPS altitude, and the transponder is sending its altitude. And so they use the altitude from that transponder encoder as the approved barometric altitude source. One of the things, now you notice it's tied back to the mode C and it's tied to the mode C's transponder or transmission. So the UAT device does not independently transmit like the uh, mode S extended squitter ADSB solution does. It only transmits in response to a ground interrogation. Example systems. So if you got a standard airworthiness for a trig system, you got a trig 22, a trig TN70 uh, GPS receiver. You can see the technical standard order numbers there. Uh, you have a trig TA70 GPS antenna, and you have a Peregrine ADSB system airspeed switch, and that's an STC. Okay. On the experimental side, you can have the TRIG-22 transponder. You could, you could use a 21, uh, but, you know, TRIG-22. Notice that the TN-72 rather than the TN-70, and you can use a TA-50 rather than the TA-70, and it's not a requirement to use the Peregrine airspeed switch. You can pick up an airspeed switch like from aircraft spruce. Okay. So what happens here is the top one in the uh, standard airworthiness category is 21 or 91 227 compliant and the purchase harness installation all of that stuff is going to run you somewhere in the neighborhood of five thousand dollars okay the same system on your experimental 
we're going to use the TN72 GPS with a SIL3 setting. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. This system will turn out to be 91227 compliant, uh, but since it's experimental aircraft, uh, we're using a different GPS receiver, so it's less expensive, and we're using a different GPS antenna, and it is less expensive. Now, the TN72 complies with TSO C199 as opposed to 145D. Uh, basically, it's the same guts, but put in a different box, and it doesn't have the paperwork trail. You know, it doesn't have all the certificates that go with it. And the antenna is a simpler one. Uh, it's like the little hockey puck antenna that we're used to instead of this approved all-weather uh, antenna that uh, the standard airworthiness wants to have. Okay. Hey, Dave, so, we have one question. Sure. In regards to mode C transponders, can ADSB see the mode C transponder? Um, we'll get to that later. That's a good question, but I've got, I've got a slide on that later that talks about it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, we're going to talk about ADSBN. So this is provided by the ground stations. So in this case, uh, we've got tr three services that are provided. Um, these are ground to air services. Uh, there is also air to air, and we'll be talking about that. So the air to air signals are near real time. The ground to air signals have an undetermined delay. And that's important when it comes to the traffic information service broadcasts, the TSB. And it is also important when we start talking about the automatic dependent surveillance rebroadcast, ADSR. If it's going through that ground station, then the ground signals have an undetermined delay. Whereas it's air to air, you know, you've just got the transmit time at the speed of light. Well, slightly less than the speed of light. Remember that for ADSB systems, ATC collision avoidance is still handled by the ground controller. Okay. Oops. Wait a minute. So the uh, other thing that's real important is the FAA in its uh, all its documentation about this drives the point home over and over and over that air to air information that is received air to air and ground to air by the ADSB in receiver is for situational awareness only. Uh, in fact, there's a specific prohibition, for instance, if you're in instrument meteorological conditions, you can't, you're, you've got a specific prohibition on using ADSB in data to maneuver. You've got to have the maneuver uh, instruction or whatever come from your controller. They are very adamant about it. All right. So if you are uh, looking for traffic information services, you can read the slide while I talk about this. This aircraft right here is called non-equipped. It is a non-ADSB equipped aircraft. It is a mode C equipped aircraft. So this is Brandon's question. It's going to mode C back to that ground, through that ground antenna and come back through the ground station, be distributed by the ground station and transmitted out on UAT, on the UAT frequency, and it's going to be transmitted out on the 1090 frequency. So what this does is this, if you've got ADS-B in, in your aircraft, installed in your aircraft, and you've got a display, then this guy's transponder is going to come down here. And of course, by the time it pops out into the control station, they've got 
range, angle, and altitude. Remember, he's mode C equipped. And so they have a three-dimension target that they transmit to you or to your aircraft, and then you can display it. So, for instance, those of you that have uh, FLARM and have the uh, TIS-B license installed, you can see the Mode C aircraft as long as they're getting all the way through the system, they can pop up as an individual target on your screen. We'll talk about those presentations when we talk about the FLARM. If you've got another uh, kind of system that's ADS-B in, again, it comes in as a target that it's recognized, whether it comes in on 1090 or whether it comes in on 978. These two guys can't see each other, and that's handled by the AD Automatic Dependent Surveillance Rebroadcast, or ADSR. So this guy is, uh, he's got a UAT, and he's got a Mode C transponder. That's the definition of his installation. But this guy doesn't have a three-dimension for this line between them. He doesn't have a three-dimension solution. So what happens is down here, the 1090 signal is being retransmitted on the UAT six frequency for this guy. That's how he gets to see the, the heavy. And the heavy gets to see the little guy because his signal is retransmitted on 1090. That's what ADSR does for you. And that is also a license on the FLARM. And we'll talk about that more later. What this does is this allows the... 1090 ES user to see the UAT 978 megahertz user, and it allows the UAT 978 megahertz user to see the 1090 ES user. Okay. The uh, now to receive the uh, uh, ADSB traffic services. Aircraft equipped with ADS-BN can receive weather and proximate traffic. In other words, traffic, you can see the position of traffic. The most reliable traffic information is air-to-air -air via ADS-B. So two 978 targets can see each other, two 1090 targets can see each other on the air-to-air. -air. If it's got to bounce through the ground, then it will go down and up like we showed with ADSR. If the aircraft is not equipped with ADSB out, so uh, it won't be identified as an ADSB or an ADS TSB or an ADSR client. If you're flying near a client aircraft and they're triggering the data, it gets transmitted and you'll be able to see it. What we're talking about is the passive systems like Stratus and uh, those kind of things. That's how they get to see the data coming up from the ground. Okay. If you are a, to be considered an AD, uh, TSB or an ADSB client by the ADSB uh, ground system, the GBT, then you have to be in an area where that service is offered. It's not offered at all of the ground sites. You have to be ADSB out equipped and there is one of the settings on your uh, ADSB device that says, I have ADSB in, and therefore I can receive the data. And you have to uh, put out a, a position within the last 30 seconds. Okay, now if you're 1090 system, you're putting out a, a position data every twice in, twice in a second. If you're a uh, uh, UAT user, you're only pulling you're only putting it out when you get an interrogation from a radar. So if you drop behind the mountain, even though you can see the ground tower, uh, you, you're not transmitting because your transponder is not transmitting because the radar rates aren't aren't triggering it. It's not getting interrogated. Now, one of the things that the FAA has stated, if you've got both. UAT and the 9, 1090 ES in your aircraft. 
they want only one device to identify that it can receive the uh, incoming data. They don't want both devices saying I can receive data. They only want one device if you've got two, if you've got both the types in your aircraft. The other kind of data that comes up from the ground is called flight information service broadcasts. So FISB. Um, this is all of the other products. So the meteorological products, uh, aeronautical data. So you can get weather maps, you can get uh, uh, airport information. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you can get. This is not client-based. This is always broadcast, but it's only broadcast on the UAT frequency. Okay? It is not broadcast on 1090. The transponder frequency does not have the bandwidth to handle all of this data. So if you want this data, you've got to have something that can receive the uh, 978 megahertz uh, signal. What are some of the things that can come across uh, right now? So you can get AirMet and SIGMET and convective SIGMET. You can get NextRad. Uh, you can get CONUS and Regional. Uh, it's fairly low uh, resolution, but you can get it. Uh, but you have to remember that all of the radars are up to, in some cases, most of them are timed to where they're no more than about five or six minutes. They update every 300 seconds to so five minutes, but they can be as much as 10 or 15 minutes since the radar, that, that image was produced. So you can get this stuff, but it's not something that you could use to, you know, try to navigate between two thunderstorm cells. You can get NOTAMs and Pyrex, special use air, uh, airspace status. All right. You can get winds and temperatures a lot too. Uh, I thought that one was interesting. Okay, today, ADSB is required for certain as, uh, airspace access. Mode C and mode S are not being phased out. Uh, you probably cannot do a new mode C or mode S installation, but those uh, right now in our current system, mode C and mode S are subsets of the ADSB uh, data suite, and they're not we're not they're not phasing that out at this point. Now transponders. Okay, this is an extraction from the uh, Denver sectional, and uh, there's Kelly R Park, home of Black Forest Soaring Society, and to the north. We have Denver International Airport, which at the time I made this slide, which has been a couple of years, it was the fifth busiest airport in the United States. We have Buckley Space Force Base, which has uh, National Guard uh, flying F-16, Air National Guard flying F-16s and uh, Army National Guard flying all kinds of helicopters. And we have Centennial Airport, which is a General Aviation Airport on the south side of the Denver metro area, which nudges in about the uh, third busiest general aviation airport in the United States. And then to the south, we've got Colorado Springs Municipal Airport and Peterson Air Force Base, are co their runways are co-located. So we've got four airports within 40 miles that handle heavies or fast movers, and they generate a lot of traffic. And there's a lot of that traffic that goes from that southern red circle up to one of those three northern red circles. To the west of the airport, so over on the left-hand side, um, that terrain elevation rises quickly and goes into the 14,000-foot range, uh, you know, maybe 50 miles, 60 miles out from the airport, but it squeezes the traffic down. Uh, and I'll show you uh, on the ADSB tower chart on the next chart. You can see evidence of that. So a lot, a lot of traffic gets compressed into this north-south corridor. Okay, now this is just the sectional with the Victor Airways on it. This is not including the SIDS and STARS. 
any approach routing for any of those airports that we've mentioned. Our solution has been all of our club gliders and our current operating tow plane have transponders. Uh, we're currently upgrading all of our club gliders to ADSB out. We have a uh, new tow plane or yeah, it's new to us. I mean, there's no such thing as a new Pawnee, right? Uh, that is getting uh, rehabbed. And when she comes out and is usable, we're going with a full-blown uh, uh, transponder ADSB out system in her. Most of our private gliders have transponders and many have ADSB out. And the number with ADSB out is increasing as uh, folks are uh, selling their older equipment and buying newer equipment, buying newer gliders. So we have uh, we have decided that, you know, for those of us that are flying in this area, we need others to see us. This is a map of uh, the ground-based transceivers, the ADSB ground stations. Uh, I pulled this one today. You can see my source on there. So thanks to the Stratix people for making this uh, chart available. Um, you can notice the concentration for density, traffic density, like LA and Chicago. You can see some up around Minneapolis and St. Louis. Okay. You can also see concentration like this, this concentration is for mountainous region. That's in the southwest part of Colorado. And this concentration is for the front range mountain. Again, to be sure that you've got coverage all through that range. So you can see that we, they, they thought there was enough traffic there that they needed to bring in more towers than what they have out here on the eastern plains or over here in southeastern Utah or the northern part of uh, Nevada up into Oregon and uh, Idaho and a little bit of California. That doesn't mean there isn't coverage out here. There's coverage out here. It's just they are ensuring that there's coverage uh, to meet either the terrain requirements or to meet the traffic requirements. Okay. You may hear that there are uh, four types of these uh, GBTs, uh, surface, low, medium, and high. The main difference is the products they provide and who their client is. Um, so it's uh, the products they provide, the maximum distance or area that they cover, and the maximum altitude of the target client aircraft. So for instance, uh, once an IFR-172 at 3000 AGL has different data needs than a 777 bombing along at flight level 350. So like the weather provided by the low tier GBTs only goes out to 100 miles, whereas the medium or high, I don't remember which one, goes out to something like 250 miles. Um, the same kind of service customization, you know, I'm only, only going to give you 50 or 100 miles worth of data, applies to the terminal winds and terminal forecasts and winds and stuff like that. The surface GBTs are the ones that are installed at the airports. Um, and I've seen the uh, service area for the one out at uh, Denver International Airport. And basically, it's real clear that uh, it's either replaced or it's definitely supplementing the uh, ground surveillance radars that they used to use at the airport for you know, traffic movement on the ground. Ground surveillance, or I mean, airborne surveillance generally begins at 500 AGL in many locations. And it, in general, for most all locations, it's available by the time you get up to 1,500 feet AGL. Okay, so, you know, I pointed out that we have more ground uh, GBTs in uh, Colorado. In our case, uh, most of the ground coverage in eastern Colorado starts at about 500 feet. Uh, there's an interesting thing. Again, this is a, uh, uh, a Google Earth map. So there's the location of Kelly Air Park. And we have two GBTs that are fairly close to Kelly. 
So we have one that is north of us, about 15 miles. Uh, it's northwest of a little town called Elizabeth. And we have one that is southwest of us, about 20 miles, which is out just southwest or southeast of us. It's southwest of a little town called Calhan by a couple of miles. Remember, ADSB, when you're running the transponder, if you're running a, a 1090 ES transponder with your uh, ADSB out, is not radar dependent. The aircraft is transmitting ADSB out signal twice per second. Uh, one of the things that I found out when I tested my system is uh, ADSB out track that was recorded by the FAA showed my ground movement from one of those two towers on the ground at Kelly. Now, Kelly's at 7,000 MSL for its field elevation. Uh, the southern, the southeast tower down here is, uh, its antennas are up about, uh, I think they're about 78, 7,900 feet. And the ones up at the north are up about 6,800 feet. But they did get a good track on me on the ground. And you could actually watch the uh, track change from ground uh, mode to air mode on the takeoff roll. And you can watch it come back and go from air mode to ground mode as I slowed down on my rollout. And you can see me roll to the end of the runway. I thought that. So this system has, uh, okay, Big Brother knows where you are. They know who you are because the ID is unique to your aircraft and they know who owns your aircraft. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help myself with that one. Okay, let's move over to broadcast services. Okay, these are services. Uh, and this is this is going into our peer-to-peer -peer network. So the two I'm going to talk about are FLARM and Soft RF, which Soft RF is a uh, DIY FLARM kind of thing. Let's just put it that way. Now, these devices are not part of the ATC system. ATC does not see these transmissions. They can't act upon them. Okay. So if you put your FLARM in before you put a transponder in, ATC doesn't see you. The only people that see you are going to be someone else that's using the same kind of equipment. So I'm going to kind of use power FLARM, you know, the U.S. device and FLARM terms interchangeably, but... FLARM is a blending of the two words flight and alarm. You can see the little thing up there. It runs at 905 to 925 megahertz. Uh, it's an industrial scientific manufacturing band under the FCC. It's a, uh, FLARM is a spread spectrum system, so it's a frequency hopper. And the FLARM device is FCC approved. Okay, that was one of the things when they were importing it. That's why it took so long to bring it into the country. It requires installation in all participating aircraft. If you don't have a FLARM unit installed in your aircraft, you are not a participating aircraft for FLARM. Okay. If uh, so, it supports dedicated and uh, dedicated display, what I would call a real time display. It supports multifunction displays. So. You can display it over on like a uh, LX9070 or on your, uh, if, you, if you can get the uh, dongle to work, you can put it on your iPhone or if you can wire it, you can put it on a uh, tablet or that kind of thing. Generally, uh, you'll see wired connections to the displays, although we're starting to see some dongles that will work with it. Um, it uses the, uh, what, the military used to call a pseudo plan position indicator. So it's a circle with the aircraft in the middle and it displays the target around it. Or on the multi-purpose displays, uh, you can get that same kind of circle or you can get just the aircraft put on a map to presentation. I'll show you that here in a couple of slides. Uh, the power farm for the United States has an integrated ADSB and mode CS uh, transponder receiver. 
So if it's an ADSB target out there, it will display the position, the flight direction, and other pertinent information and give warnings just like it was a farm target. Uh, but you are receiving this directly from the other aircraft. It's not coming from the ground system. You're receiving it directly from the other aircraft. The mode CS, since it doesn't have a direction, all it has is that mode C and uh, the mode C indicator. So it's got altitude. It will put a little circle of dots and it was going to estimate based on how long it took the signal to get to the air, uh, to your receiver, how far away it is. Now, hard to believe that it was January of 2021 when we're sitting here in 2024, but FLARM software, Power FLARM, was updated in version 7.03 to add support for the ADSR and the TISB rebroadcast services. This is USA only. OK, and it requires the purchase of a separate license. If you've got the original Power Farm core, it comes with the Power Farm Fusions that they're selling now or the Farm Fusions. I'm not sure of the total nomenclature. And then the other one is it has an IGC approved flight recorder and it has a engine noise uh, level sensor. Again, you might have to purchase an activation license for that. I'm not sure of what all the you know, what all the details are there. Okay. So, the uh, ADSR is going to make UAT equipped aircraft, ADSB out, visible to the power farm. And it's going to make TISB, so the mode C slash S non directional targets are going to get turned into full 3D targets on your power farm. However, what you'll probably find is that they've got weird, uh, they've got weird radio identifiers because uh, enough people complain to the FAA about having their real identifier uh, retransmitted that they went to some kind of random number generator. So the other thing that can happen, uh, we're seeing it. I don't know if it's, I don't know who has to change something to correct it, but I have had cases where it looks like I have a ghost that's following me. It looks like it's either off one wing or behind me or something like that. And it's only, it can be up, it can be as close as just a few hundred feet or it can be out. Uh, and it's annoying when it gets to be close because sometimes it sets off the collision warning in farm. And that's, it appears to be my transponder processing through the ground radar system and getting reflected back to me as a TISB target. Okay, power flarm. Older power flarm versions. Okay, 709 went out of date, uh, 29th of February. Right now, 720 and 721 are still flyable this year. 720 is going to fade out in June. The current version is 722, and that runs out until February of uh, 2025. By the way, there were no public releases between 709 and 720. So don't get upset and go looking for it or think you missed something. Currently, FLARM is working on a 15 month release cycle and then they recommend that you update every 12 months so that, you know, if, you're, if your firmware expires under the current system, under the current mechanism, if your firmware expires, then the later versions of firmware won't talk to you anymore. They won't use your data and you can't and you don't know you won't if the if the upgrade changed something on their side, then you won't see them. Okay. Now, having said that, on February 2nd this year, Flarm Technology announced a revision to their firmware versioning policy that will allow older releases to remain active. In other words, for instance, let's say that uh, at some point this year, if you had 709 installed and you hadn't installed anything after that, at some point later this year, 709 might come back active again. Now, the quote, the bottom line is a quote. This is from uh, Flarm Technologies webpage. If you want to read the whole thing, go to their blog section section and you will find it. 
And that quote is, hopefully by mid-2024, the first software updates without an expiration date will be available for download for most devices. Okay, version 7.22 came out in October of 2023. This capability is not yet available. You know, it's one of those, you know, keep an eye on uh, the updates and when you take when you get a new update take a look at the uh, release notes and uh, see if they've uh, added this capability but it's not there right now when we're talking about farm displays all right there's a status so it says i'm seeing one transmitter okay so in this display that's got uh, three aircraft displayed there, uh, a red one, a green one, and a circle dots. Only one of them is a FLARM aircraft. Only one of them is a FLARM. This is the number of FLARM that you're talking to. This is your identifier. Um, this is the, it, in FLARM terminology, it is the radio ID or most of us that have a mode S or higher transponder, we put in our ICO six digit code. Okay. And the code will be zero through nine and A through F. So DD nine C seven eight. I'm assuming with the D that this is probably from Germany. The uh, And uh, so it will put the form identification up there. And if you have entered in the FLARMNET database, your radio ID or your ICO ID and your contest number, this will display your contest number. You have the distance to the selected target. The one with the blue circle is the selected target. And the vario of the selected target. So this target is climbing at a half a meter per second and the relative altitude to the target. So the target is 453 meters below us. So he's green. Uh, the color code is green for below, red for near or warning, and blue for above. That's their default coding. Status of your GPS receiver. Like I said, the blue circle indicates that you've selected that one to have their information displayed over here. Uh, there's a label. Uh, there's a set of labels that uh, you can have. So I'm assuming that that label is probably the rate of climb uh, on two of the targets, just from the way the numbers look. And then this circle is a... Mode C that's being received directly. So, uh, you know, you've got a, you know, you could have an altitude with it, but you've got a mode C target out there. One of these two targets is uh, farm, and the other is likely, uh, well, from that number, is either a farm or it's an ADSB target. Okay. And then the airplane in the center is you, and then the zoom level is this is uh, one kilometer, okay? Now, if you're sitting on the ground and still the top of the display is north, if you're moving, then the compass rose rotates so that it's pointing, it's telling you what direction you're pointed. And that's what the display looks like. So we've got one farm target, one ADSB target, and one mode C slash S target. And I talked about the above and below. And like I said, these, these labels are configurable. So you could put, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think on mine, I have uh, the uh, uh, contest number or the aircraft ID pop up there. There's a set of displays. There's an alarm display that will pop up and it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's arranged as a clock. So this is the up is the nose of the plane. So the uh, top two, these are normal FLARM displays. This is saying I've got somebody over here. 
and I've got somebody down here. So somebody at about 10 o'clock and somebody at about five o'clock and whichever one is the closest one is uh, 659 meters away from me. I've got somebody up here that's not quite as important, but with the red bar right in the middle that says whichever one of these is the closer is at my altitude or plus or minus a little bit of my altitude. This one says, I've got somebody out here at 233 meters at my altitude, uh, but the threat level is much lower. Uh, the other reason that I might have somebody that's high and further away is the relative closing speed, because that's part of what the algorithm is looking at. It's, tra it, it's trying to compute when, when things will go bump. So 15, 30, 45, whatever seconds out. So this one might be closer, but there's a very there's very little closing speed, although there might be a little bit of closing speed there. This one is uh, a non-directional. So this is a mode C or a mode S. Um, and it's estimating that it's 561 meters away from us and basically at our altitude. This one, uh, the FLARM has the capability of having an obstruction database, a ground obstruction database. And so this one is telling you there's a ground obstruction at 270 meters. So that's an obstacle warning. This one, you see the big red dot in the middle? That's what happens when you have a non-directional that gets so close that it can't really put a circle of dots around it it just puts a big blob and a red blob means that there's somebody near you and uh, you don't know which direction it is. This is the absolute, and this in this case it's red, so he's plus or minus you by a, just a little bit. This is the absolute scariest display I've ever had come up. Most of the time when I see this display, it's either blue or green, but I've had it pop up red every once in a while and your head goes on a swivel like you wouldn't believe and it's amazing how hard it is to see something even like the size of a 737 it's just okay other possible displays now these two displays are not displaying the same aircraft so here's the farm display that we were just discussing and the one on the right uh xc soar will give you this circular display with you in the middle. And so this aircraft is blue. So that's the one that's selected. Uh, contest number of TH. He's climbing at 2.6 meters per second. He's 130 meters above me and he's 402 meters away. Okay. This is what the map displays look like on the left. This is an XC SOAR map that they also have their Vario information. And then you can see the circular farm radar screen right here. And so you can see these two targets and you can see these same two targets over here. So this gives you a nice situational awareness. Uh, one of the things, and in fact, I wanna go back one slide. This display, is a separate FLARM display in your panel. This happens to be a uh, FLARM view uh, display. That's the name of the product. This is a real-time display. This little box has one function in the world, and that's to accept the data stream from your FLARM box and display the information to you as fast as possible. The FLARM sends a packet of data once a second. So that's why they tell you, you know, have the speed up between your box and the uh, display as high as your devices will handle. Because you can actually get enough targets out here that you can't get a full message every second because the data transfer is too slow. I run mine at, uh, at least uh 56k and i think i have one glider that i fly that i run it much higher than that this is on your multi-purpose display 
this guy is, in addition to displaying this information, this guy is doing your map display. It's doing your navigation. In general, this display is not generating alarms. And even if it were generating alarms, it's sharing the workload with all of the other work you've asked your navigation computer. So this guy or this guy, keeping track of all your altitudes and directions and plotting your map and all that map background stuff, it's sharing that farm processing with all that other work. Um, figure out what kind of real-time display you can put in there, have a real-time display. Don't depend on your multi-purpose display to give you a warning. Some of the software won't give you warnings, but even if the software will give you warnings, this guy's doing an awful lot of work, okay? He may not have time to do everything. All righty. The uh, how Power Farm works, it has an internal GPS position. It broadcasts its position plus a forecast about what a limited indication of what its three future 3D track is. The receiver listens for a power farm device and processes the data that's received. It runs the uh, forecast data through a prediction algorithm. It's looking to create potential conflicts. The software claims it can do up to 50 other aircraft. Okay. That's an awful lot of people to have within your, you know, your little world. And then it alerts the pilot using visual and oral warnings. Um, you got to have a speaker for it to use the audio. The internal barometric sensor, it has to have an internal uh, IGC flight recorder, and it uses that for the uh, uh, internal barometric sensor for the IGC flight recorder. Now, soft RF. Soft RF is a DIY unit. It's an Internet of Things-based little proximity awareness device. It is FLARM compatible for proximity awareness. And I'm not saying fully compatible, I'm saying it's FLARM compatible. Right now, it processes Air Protocol version six, which is basically the grandfather of almost everything out there right now. So it can do the basic work and it can also handle uh, NEMA data, okay? So it has its own little uh, Jeep built in GPS and the way it communicates uh, between the 915, you know, the center of the 905 to 925 radio band, it has a Wi-Fi. So you would connect to it with a tablet or a phone or your other computer, your, you know, your main computer in the cockpit, you would connect to it via Wi-Fi. This guy is standalone. He's battery powered. I'll show you some pictures of him of a couple here in a few minutes. Uh, again, if you, you know, everybody's got to be talking either Flarm or Soft RF for this to work. Somebody doesn't have either one, then they're not part of your universe. Uh, the physical display, you get a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, the fixed address is 192.168.1.1. You know, so. If you're in the clubhouse and trying to, trying to connect to this thing, uh, walk outside and get away from the uh, Wi-Fi for the clubhouse because otherwise you're going to be fighting trying to figure out to connect to either the club Wi-Fi or this device. Or if you've got three of them sitting there running, they all want to connect to the same address. Okay. Um, there's a possibility of Bluetooth, but I've never gotten that to work on the ones that I played with. Uh, the display capability depends on the kind of display that you're plugging it into and what its software can do. This thing has no ADS-B or mode C, mode S, transponder, receiver kind of things in it. So basically, this, is, this looks very much like the original form capabilities without an integrated display. Okay. The... Uh, Yeah. 
okay, this is what the boxes look like. Uh, these little boxes are all done with 3D printers. The board fits down in there. You can have a little display that's giving you status, or you can have no display. There are some out there with rudimentary displays, so these would be kind of equivalent to a, uh, uh, a Flarm portable. Again, no, uh, no 1090 reception at all. Okay. So in this case, there are considerations. Each use of the ISM band is unlicensed. So this device has to tolerate any interference, but it's not tested by the FCC. So it, it could be a noisy device, depending on where you buy it. It could interfere with other things. It could be interfered with by other things. Nothing's been tested. It's using a software-defined radio, which, you know, that's, that's no biggie. And it does appear to work in the same manner as a power farm. It receives other things. I've worked with it with XC SOAR, LK8000, and CU Mobile. Uh, I've ground tested it at our home airport. Uh, I took it out, Wi Fi connected to it with a XC SOAR on a tab A, Samsung tab A, with the power farm installed in my Ventus and walked around the airport and they could see each other. I haven't played with soft RF in the air, so that's all I need, you know, that needs to get tested. We ha I haven't found any evidence online indicating that it causes problems operating in a power farm environment, um, but the ISM band is very busy. There are a lot of users out there, and uh, so it's kind of hard to say how you know, since this isn't hasn't gone through any kind of FCC testing, uh, it's kind of hard to say what you could get into with uh, interference. But uh, we played with it to, uh, uh, but I don't know of anybody that's been flying with one. Oh no, wait a minute, we've got one person that's been flying with one at our club. But uh, and their their usage seems to be uh, pretty good. All right, let's move on to passive devices. We're getting close to the end. These are the various receivers. Uh, these devices are receive only. They generally have two antennas sticking out on them. One's for 978 megahertz for UAT and the other's for 1090. These are using uh, uh, software-defined radios. They receive the TSB from the ground station they uh, will only receive ADSR if there's an ADSR client nearby. Uh, they do require an external display, and they don't work with FLARM. So these are dual band ADSB in receivers. So this is what you see in a lot of uh, power. You know, you see them in powered aircraft feeding the uh, electronic flight book in the uh, in the cockpit. So Stratic. You can go through these uh, Stratix. Uh, they, their software runs on a Raspberry Pi. You can build one or you can get it assembled. It needs a tablet for display and it's third-party display software. Stratus, they have an integrated system and you purchase it assembled. Century is an integrated system. You purchase it assembled and they have an agreement with ForeFlight. Garmin has the GDL uh, devices. And uh, there's another company called Dual, which has an assembled device, okay? Oops, there we go. They don't work with Florm, okay? These guys are ADSB in receivers. So the, the Stratix, Stratus, um, and Century, and this is what the uh, Garmin looks like, and this is what the Dual looks like. All right, issues in our little universe. ADSB, uh, as the FAA constantly beats on you when you go hit their uh, sites, is the information received both air to air and ground to air by ADSB receiver is for situational awareness only. That data is not intended 
for direct uh, collision avoidance, but you know, like you saw it on the uh, maps for XC SOAR and for uh, CU Mobile, you know, on an OD, uh, it does give you a nice view looking at it, saying where are people, and so. While it, while it doesn't give you warnings of collisions, it does give you a nice situational awareness view of what the universe looks around you. This is the uh, ADSR ring or hockey puck or donut, whatever you want to call it. If this guy in the middle is an ADSB client, it triggers the ground to send ADSR 15 nautical mile radius, so 30 miles across and 3,500 feet, plus or minus 3,500 feet, so 7,000 feet. It will get the uh, ADSR signals from, if he's 97 or if he's 978, he will get all the 1090 traffic that fits inside this hockey puck. If he's 1090, he will get from ADSR all of the 978 traffic that fits in this hockey puck. If you happen to be in this hockey puck and you don't qualify as an ADS ground system client, but you're in that hockey puck, you will get usable data if you have an ADS B in display, like the passive receivers or your flarm, but you, you know, you don't have the, you're not an ADS B out person but you have the farm that processes ADSB in, and you've got the license for ADSR in TISB, if you're in that hockey puck, you will get the ADSR data because this guy's requesting it. Looking at the integration, okay, TCAS is detects possible collision events and issues traffic alerts and resolution advisories to the pilots. So it's going to say there's a traffic alert, and if it gets bad enough, it's going to say pull up, push over, turn left, turn right, something. Okay, it's going to tell you to do something. ADSBN does not detect possible collision events, nor does it issue traffic alerts or resolution advisories. You, know, you can have the data displayed, but there's nothing inherent in ADSB in that's going to tell you there's a problem. You have to be looking at it to see it. Okay, that might mean your head's down in a in a thermal. I wouldn't want to be there trying to read my ADSB screen. Power farm, which was designed for our environment, detects possible collision events and issues traffic alerts. It does not tell us to turn left, right, climb, descend, whatever, okay? But what it does do for us is it integrates FLARM, the 1090 megahertz ADSB, and the 1090 megahertz mode CS. Um, the alerts are sent from, uh, it sends an alert message to the display device, and then the display device is the thing that puts it up in front of you. With the 7.3 version and the additional software license, then we add the uh, ADSB in for uh, TISB and the ADSB in for ADSR. So uh, if you're looking for a solution, my first one, uh, given the environment that I've described to you for where I fly, my choice there would be transponder first and FLARM second. I've got both in my glider. I've got ADSB out and I've got FLARM and I've got the extra license and all of that. Um, but, you know, the, the biggie is I don't want to get run over by a 737 or, a, you know, heaven forbid, an A380. Um, but my choice would be transponder first and FLARM second. If I was in a less demanding airspace environment and my primary concern was other gliders, I would make it FLARM first and transponder second. Okay. So we're down to the question part. All right, Dave, a lot of good comments on here. Everybody's loving uh, the detail that you've presented. Got a few questions here. So 
how far uh how far can a control station pick up the mode c transponder um the um control station doesn't okay that it, it's kind of a trick question because mode c underlies the adsb out but if you're talking about pure mode C, the ground station is not receiving the mode C. That's received by a radar system. Okay. You know, an air traffic control radar system. The ground stations do have a 1090 receiver, but the 1090 receiver, uh, the all the detector circuits and all the processing is aimed at processing a full uh, ADSB uh, transmission uh, data packet, and so it's it's not it's not doing anything with a, a pure mode C packet. Okay, next question: What is the compelling reason for the glider community to use a closed proprietary system such as Flarm? Um, because they produced it. <laughs> you know, uh, well, I'm not seriously. Flarm, right. te Flarm technology produced it, and we globbed onto it because no one else was doing a uh, uh, an open system development on that project. Um, and Flarm put their money into it. I mean, it's like buying an Apple iPhone versus buying somebody else's phone. Okay, but there's uh, the Soft RF was a is a community effort to move it out. Uh, but at some point, Flarm Technology locked down their uh, airborne protocols. And so the last airborne protocol that was released in the wild was version six. Fortunately, all of them produce at least version six underlying all of the other capabilities. You know, they're up to like version nine right now. So there are things version nine can do that version six can't do, but version six can process the version six data out of a version nine transmission. So at least they kept the backward compatibility that way. Uh, the same thing runs with the uh, OGN network. Okay, the OGN network, it was not something that uh, uh, Flarm initially supported and I don't know what uh, Flarm technology and I don't know where uh, that relationship is today. But the main reason we're using it is because uh, fundamentally, there's nothing else out there that's doing that kind of job and keeping everything updated. I mean, they're doing two software releases a year and uh, adding additional capabilities and, uh, you know, moving our hardware forward. That's that's. I send them my money <laughs> or I did. All right, uh, I'm going to call this the last question. I know you've been at this for quite a while tonight. In practice, what percentage of powered aircraft are you seeing uh, via power flarm in uh, our area, Kelly Air Park? Um, my discovery when I first started flying with flarm, and that's been over, well over 10 years, maybe 15 years, maybe even longer, um because i jumped on the bandwagon when uh i got one of the first batches i got one of the first batches that came in and put it in my glider uh percentage wise I, actually that's the wrong question what i found out when i put the flarm in my aircraft and started seeing all of this transponder traffic it made me realize how much I wasn't seeing by looking outside. I was seeing aircraft and going, uh, you know, and I turned to look and it was hard to pick it out. Okay. Uh, so the general aviation aircraft being small and, uh, you know, generally, even if they're at our altitude, when we look out and we're looking towards the horizon, you know, if they're above the horizon, they kind of stand out. If they're below the horizon, they're hard to see. Uh, I have to admit that there have been plenty of times that that thing has pointed out traffic to me that I did not see on my scan. And then the other one is, is the traffic that's coming in behind me, uh, you know, because 
you know, we all have this huge blind spot behind us. The other thing uh, that really surprised me was uh, uh, the heavies uh, that I see. Uh, I'm an instrument rated pilot, so I, I know how to read the SIDS and STARS and the instrument approach stuff and that kind of thing. And so I do know where some of those routes are just from, uh, you know, I haven't flown that for a long time, but I'm cognizant of where some of those routes are. And I've been really surprised to see traffic pop up and go, oh, yeah, there is a, uh, you know, there is an entry route from that point going into DIA, or there is an entry point going from that point down to Colorado Springs. And just a reminder that the heavies are out there. So it's not so much a percentage of it versus the gliders that I see. It's the fact that what I'm doing, even with gliders, is I'm more aware of the other aircraft that are flying in our environment than I was prior to flying with the Florham. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. That's uh, that's the questions I have for you. Um, I appreciate the whole presentation, and I think this is the third time I've seen it, so I'm picking up more. <laughs> Another 20 more times, I think I'll be there. Well, the, the real thing about this to understand is uh, air traffic controls, uh, collision avoidance. We do not fall into the model of the kind of airspace usage that they think of. And so we have to be careful around their aircraft. And the best thing we can do is put in a transponder so they see us on their collision avoidance systems. I've actually had a, uh, I've watched an airliner that was coming towards me turn away, you know, alter course to move away from me. Um, and so, uh, you know, installing these systems in our aircraft help us in our peer-to-peer -peer system but it also helps us when we're working with the larger national airspace system because it makes us visible to them. And, uh, and they do take it seriously and they do divert if it uh, looks like it's appropriate. Now, the small biz jets, man, we're, you know, the only saving grace about those is that they show up on the farm uh, because I don't think most of them have, you know, I, don't, I think they fall below the, the threshold for the requirement of a TCAS kind of a system. Okay, uh, next time. So Friday, 7 p.m. on April 5th, we're going to talk about model-based weather forecasting. Thank you, everyone, for participating this evening. I think we're done. And Frank, it's back to you. Okay, thanks everybody for attending and uh, we're gonna, the recording will be up within, uh, oh, probably 12 hours or sooner on the uh, SFA website under webinars and the uh, notes, uh, the slides and the, uh, the recording will be up on members.ssa.org about maybe a little bit earlier because it takes a while for YouTube to process the video. Have a good evening. Thanks for coming.